Hello and welcome to the Strange Brew podcast. My name is Jason Barnard and that was Rival Sons, Bird in the Hand from their forthcoming album, Dark Fighter. And that's because I've got Scott Holiday, guitarist and songwriter for Rival Sons, one of the best bands of the last 20 years, which is why they're on the Strange Brew. A huge welcome, Scott. Bless you for saying that. Happy to be here, man. Thank you. I've been loving listening to the album recently. It's got quite a dark undertone. Absolutely. We have, um, and it's hard for me to talk about the theme of this record without at least subtly including the record, subsequent record that's going to come out, which is Lightbringer. So what we have is like basically two records, one that kind of casts the shadow that, that you're talking about, sort of casts the shadow. And there are some bright spots, notably things like bright light. There, there has to be some light and shade involved in both collections for us. But I think overall, you have something that kind of illustrates uh, some divisiveness and some darker themes, personal ones to Jay, and just overall kind of like umbrella shadowy feelings that we've kind of been through in the last couple of years, few years, really. And then you have a, a companion or an answer album that I'm saying is more of a, an illuminating record, a light that uh, a record that casts more of a light on that shadow. And that's the idea. Generally, we would never write a record uh, that especially ends on such a note. It kind of swirls down, you know, and I like to think of our band as more of a band of hope. And if you listen to all of our records, there's there's a lot of hope on those records, at least on and how they conclude and wrap up. It's kind of always an uptick that illustrates love and light and hope. You know, and I know that can be corny to people. That's okay. But that's where our hearts are, man. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being a little like romantic like that. That's just what we are. <laughs> Was it a case of that you having a lot of material to work with for both arms, partially impacted by the pandemic and the constraints of touring, therefore more time for working on uh, music? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're, we're a group that completes records off the cuff very quickly in general with feral roots we worked a little bit longer you know normally we're like a month we'll make a record with no material talked about to that point we'll just come in hit the floor running and i'll go through a back catalog of what i've been working on and jay will do the same we'll throw it into the room with our producer and i'll start mixing it up and write it record it mix it done that's it get back in the van or the bus we're leaving we're going back on tour while it's getting mixed or you know mastered and that's how we've done it with Pharaoh roots we spread it over a couple months because we had a little bit of time there was a little gap there for us that we were home with this record there was a significant gap for the entire world to be home and we couldn't really book the studio out i think we may have like worked a lot quicker if we could but it didn't work out like that. And as soon as we only had one week with our producer in Nashville to start, we knew, well, of course we got to come back. And if we only get another week, there's no way we're going to finish the record in two one week sessions. And every time we, we would go, we'd go record for a, a week with Dave Cobb in Nashville. It's like we, we started a couple new songs. We started recording songs that me and Jay had written it's like all of this stuff. And then we need to record at home to wrap those up. And as we wrapped those up and did a bunch of home recording, we could kind of see like what we would write next. And we already had more songs back kind of logged, but we wrote new ones now too. And those are what we're going to take in along with what we did. And it just started to snowball. You know what I mean? And okay, now we're really, we're really in this now. And it was just a different process altogether because of that. Most notably, we had this refractory period every time we would go into the studio and come home and we could become very focused and um, it was great. It wasn't that we recorded, you know, a hundred songs or anything. It was still pretty focused and we're still playing that game of kill your darlings and don't be too precious, but it did create a larger bed, a larger uh, collection of focused material. So when we came to the point of narrowing things down, like you always do, we were not going to make a 15 song hour and 15 album. It's just, it's a big bite. And it's the two parts that I told you, one casting the shadow, one throwing the light. That seemed very clear when we started to move things around and go, 
oh, there it is. Instead of making it all light shade, light shade, you know what I mean? Throughout this long piece, there was a clear one and two, you know, and, and it did exactly what we would normally want to do on an album. So that's how we how we essentially put everything together. I assume it was important in relation to the the order of the albums because you've got Dark Fighter first and some of the material that you released in advance of the album, like Nobody Wants to Die, has got that amphemic quality. But having the light come after with Light Bringer was important. Definitely because that's the kind of band we are, again, because it's, I think, the way we look at life. And there's probably artists, that we know there's artists out there that would love to end it dark because that just feels great to them. <laughs> that's where their their heads are and their hearts and they want to take people on that ride. But I think for me, again, there's a, a slightly more romantic outlook on life and how I like to be presented my art. This, I think may, mainly it's just an outlook on things and, and I want to make sure that, that that ride ends that way for people. Prior to Rival Sons and in your formative years, what were the key bands or artists or songs that you loved or inspired you? 
as a young kid, I listened to a lot of what my folks listened to because they were rock and roll people. And I was quick to kind of go delving around their collections, even if it wasn't what they were listening to currently. I went through their old albums, through their old cassettes. Remember those old mini briefcases with cassettes in them? <laughs> yeah, I delved into those. They had they had a cupboard where all the vinyl was and boxes of these little briefcases. And I'd secretly go in there and pop those tape cassette tape things open and hijack a whole handful of those. So my whole family was a big Led Zeppelin family. So I was really into Zeppelin as a kid, really into Hendrix, the cream, uh, really early got into the stones really early, uh, Brian Jones years through the past darkly. That's still to this day, my favorite era of the stones. I love that Brian Jones era. It's so far out and also led me to like, uh, early pink Floyd, this was stuff that I cut my teeth on as a, as a young guitar player. Yardbirds, Jeff Beck, ZZ Top. But then I listened to, you know, as a young kid, you listen to pop music, man. I listen to Michael Jackson, listen to Hall & Oates, you know. Phil Collins is on the radio. I was an 80s kid, so all that stuff was around, you know what I mean? You know, so it's funny how a lot of that pop music was just there. And it wasn't anything you could, like, really like as a rock and roll kid it seeps in those pop hooks that's it and as you get older you i would go back to that as a, as a teenager and in my 20s stuff and go i just missed this whole thing i mean i i didn't even get into like bands like the cure or depeche mode or any of that because i was a rock and roll guy and if i liked that my friends would want to like laugh or <laughs> whatever like but when you start going back to these types of bands you just see the craft as you get older, you know what I mean? And you go, man, that was that was the era. So tell us about the how Rival Sons came together. The first album was, or an element of it was recorded when you were known as Black Summer Crush, but Jay hadn't joined. Was it something like that? Something like that. Yeah, for me, I was looking to build essentially this band and I had found a singer friend that had been turned on to me through other managers he was a really sweet guy and had just moved into town and has had success and stuff. And his manager wanted to work with us and was a great guy. So we started working together and I had like built kind of a small catalog of songs that I thought I would impress upon my musicians that I'm looking for. And I started to get him to sing some stuff that I was doing. I was writing everything, mel melodies and recording at home. And it wasn't so much that he would be a writing partner for me. That wasn't the connection, but he, he could sing. And I kind of coached him through a bunch of these songs and we started to build a band and I was able to find Miley next and Miley found Robin. So essentially it was me, Miley Robin and this other singer. And we got to the point where we were going to make a record and I connected with Dave Cobb. I was turned on by some, uh, some friends of mine you should meet this new producer. We just worked with him. He's new. He's great. Dave Cobb. Okay. So I went up to LA, met with them and he was great. And uh, we had a really good vibe. We talked a lot about rock and roll and, you know, agreed on a lot of what was the greatest and what we could contribute, where rock and roll is, what, where it needs to go, which for me was a big part of this band when starting it. Like, man, people are forgetting that like, yeah, the, that that niche area of rock and roll that's really important to me, that like garagey, dirty, bluesy rock and roll, it seems like it's going away. This was like 2005 or 2006 or something. That was that Strokes type era or something. Yeah, but even like so much active-y kind of nickelback-y, active-y, big, coming out of uh, like rap metal all like like new metal and all this kind of stuff and it's just like man everyone has forgotten the boogie and rock and roll it's not around like you got the strokes but that was so much more less rock and roll and more of like an indie i love the strokes by the way but that wasn't what i was thinking i was almost thinking like early green or like strawberry alarm clock like the Sandels, yeah. 
like um like i was thinking like garage rock like whited out soul fuzz rock no case like the nuggets like that that kind of a thing nuggets and like like um early stones and like that psychedelic era i just felt like man this should have a seat at the table right now it seems like a great answer to all this like overproduced mega guitar sound big ridiculous voices like this bellowy bigness of everything it needs an answer and if i look at retrospectively the strokes kind of were providing that to a degree but um i wanted it to be a little more hippie just a little bit more it doesn't got to go all the way to the bell bottoms it doesn't need to do that but but i did think it needed to be a little more guitar-y and not just like these upstate new york kind of like brat pack it needed to be a little more like psychedelic for me so that's what i wanted to start out doing and that's what i kind of did with dave it had to be like small faces chocolate watch band far out like that you know fun adventurous total like escapism and also involved great fuzz guitar and also involved rhythm and blues bass and drums doing something very significant together with good fuzz guitar when i um came up with this with dave and had this idea he really could run with the ball and that's kind of what we did at that time and we made before the fire and this was essentially a lot of recording off the floor um a handful of ideas that i had brought in and then i wrote the words along with dave cobb assisting me we had that record and then somebody took a song we'd done some licensing with it and it's got the other singer on it mind you somebody had used one of the songs on a tv show the girls next door that playboy they had taken a song and used it which is great we would have let them use it and take the money probably and they didn't ask us they just used it okay so they gave us a little bit of money for doing that and at that point i had gone through the whole thing of realizing the singer i'm using right now isn't the right guy i need a partner i need a foil i need somebody i can write with and i was lucky enough to find jb cannon who was uh just perfect really you know just like the perfect foil the perfect voice that i had been looking for jay joins the band we got this money for this license thing on this record that we had completed, but seemingly the record is useless because it's got some other dude on it. So I told Jay, I know you write, and I know you don't want to sing a bunch of stuff that I wrote, but I have this record that we did with Dave Cobb. It's really good. It's not just like a demo. It's not just like a pretty good. It's really good. It's solid writing on my part like lyrically like it's from the heart you should sing this record and he was already playing some of these songs with us we had messed around with it and um after twisting his arm a little bit he agreed to do it so we used that money from the e-network to go back in open that record up and let him sing on everything so now we had a record pretty much right when we started the band immediately jay joined we're the rival sons bam we have a record he said Basically, I'll go in and sing before the fire and I'll whip ass all over it. (laughs) And he did. He did to the point of singing like On My Way, which is a great, great moment for him on that record and a very important song to me. He's singing in one take. We did not do a second take. We all sat in the room. He did one take. That take you hear is the only time he sung it. We looked at each other. Everybody kind of went, holy shit, man. That was like, that's like some like old school, like, you like really took a hold of that track and took it somewhere, you know, it was just beautiful. So he said, I will do this, but we're never doing this again. (laughs) And as we move forward, I write songs. That's what I do. And that's how we're going to do it. And I was, of course, that's exactly what I wanted. I don't want to write everything. I want to work with somebody. So we got, we got dirty in the studio immediately. Shadows fall on my eyes. 
soon as we as, as we had that record first record done we were in our rehearsal room five six days a week for six hours a day just banging it out just sweating in a rehearsal room in the industrial area of the outskirts of la 
<laughs> like where they make hot sauce and, and tennis shoes, just like banging it out, sweating our days out at this like rundown rehearsal space and wrote Sleepwalker, Get What's Coming. Uh, Jay had brought Torture in and these kinds of songs. And they're what we played live. And it's what we immediately knew we had to follow up before the fire with quickly. So that's what we did. We had those two records inside of like six months or something. Jay writing in this band. And you can hear that it's a lot bluesier. Our sound changes when he comes. Then we get signed to, uh, we sign a deal with, with Earache. And this is now a record that's actually going to be promoted with a team and be looked at a little bit more seriously because there's, there's people on it. And that's pressure in time. We have a budget. Uh, the record's going to come out. It's going to be worked. And it sounds a little different, I think, because of that. I think we're writing into something. Not that we changed our sound or anything like that, but we know the record's going to come out. We know it's going to be worked. So we put a bit more um, emphasis and make something a bit more complete in that way. What was it like being signed to Earache? Uh, I initially thought Earache's offer to, to sign Rival Sons was a joke. I thought it was a group of people at a at a thrash death metal label taking a piss. Like this is hilarious. Let's offer let's offer this blues band, this psychedelic blues band a deal. I honestly felt that way to the point of telling my manager, "You need to go back and make sure they're not kidding because I feel like this is by them being assholes and thinking that it's funny to like offer a band like this a record deal. It doesn't make sense. They're putting out like the heaviest bands. That's a heavy label. That's a really thrashy death metal label. So it just didn't compute to me. And my manager at the time, the great Tom Consolo, came back to me and said, uh, it's not a joke. They're not kidding. And it's a good deal. And I think we can work with them. I think I can turn this deal into something good for you guys. And I think they mean well and are going to do something with you. So we actually met up with them and it did end up actually sounding very interesting. And we loved the idea of being a black sheep on this metal label. That's interesting. Being, you know, four boys from California, Southern California, signing to this death metal label in Nottingham. Yeah. Sounds kind of cool to me. That's weird. And I just liked it. I just ended up kind of falling in love with the idea. Like, that's cool. I bet you they're going to work hard, too, because they have nothing like this. I bet you they're going to do something with it. Like, they're going to have something to prove. And it ended up being that way very much. Guys like uh, Dan Tobin over there specifically, Talita Jenman, who uh, who did all of our PR with Dan, they really worked hard and put in, I think, 10 times the amount of work you'd think they could and opened a lot of doors. Also, coming through the metal community, like you mentioned, it's I, I learned something about that community. I've been a metal guy my whole life, too. Besides all the other artists I mentioned to you, there was a very strong thread of like Metallica, Anthrax, Slayer, Megadeth, Punk Acts, like Suicidal. And these were just things that were around when I was a kid. And what I learned playing those communities to those audiences, those festivals, was that, man, I feel like these. this is the most loyal, welcoming audience and the only other place you really see this is like in country music. Because even rock fans can be fickle. Indie is the most fickle. Alternative can be fickle. They they kind of like like they want the, the newest, coolest thing. And people move on. In metal, they don't. Once you love a metal band, you love them. And you stay with them. And I found as we kept our career going with Earache and coming back to those people... They were there for us, man. And they were, they felt close and they felt invested and they were always with us. And they are to this day. And I appreciate them. And I have no problem at all coming through that back door, as I like to call it, coming through the metal door and, and getting a little bit of light on the band. It's really cool. I remember playing the first time we played uh, Hellfest in, uh, in France. We're like, we're playing a Hellfest and it was all really heavy bands and bands like wearing makeup and it all in all black. These poor sons of bitches, they're in black trench coats. It's like 90 <laughs> degrees. And we decided when we played here, we should play our lighter songs. Just saying. It's all, it's all everyone's playing all these heavy songs. We should play Face of Light. 
we should play like on my way. We should play like our ballads for these people. And we did it. And you know what happened? It was all lighters. It was all arm in arm. It was a bunch of these people. Now their makeup was running because they were all crying. And they're just a sensitive group of people. Like the metal community is their gentle sheep in wolves clothing. <laughs> Getting Storm Thorgerson involved in, in the sleeve design for Pressure and Time. Yeah, you know, we um, when we signed to Eric and we finished the record, they loved the record. My president there, Dan Tobin, loved it. They were super excited. It was everything they wanted it to be. We were happy with it. We made something good, we felt like. that's We said, you know, sometimes you hit it. Like, we said what we wanted to say. We feel good. There's no flat spots. We're happy. And it came time to put the art together. And there was a lot of energy and excitement with the record. So they were like, do whatever you want. What do you want to do? And I remember thinking, well, if I really just imagine what in the world I could possibly do, that would be the coolest thing ever. I would use hypnosis. I would use use Storm. Obviously, hypnosis isn't a thing anymore, which is the company. He's still doing it. I know he's still doing it because I just saw the Mars Volta records he did. and He's still kind of active making these weird album covers that's who i would want to work with because we're on earache and we're not on some giant major label i figured that's just really a a, a hail mary and i didn't even think the, the the label would take it seriously like it's not like we're working with giant budgets but um he actually the, the president actually reached out to storm and sent him the record he loved the record and he wants to do the album it was just like totally random. He ended up meeting with them in a pub and talking about everything. And, and Storm said, I'd like to do it. These guys are great, which is just an achievement in its own for us, for me. So um, now we're going to do this. Wow. Amazing. So we start getting all these concept drawings. This is how Storm works. It sends us like maybe 10 different concept drawings. And they're all exactly what you would think. Super illusion looking subliminal message very storm thurgison very hypnosis very pink floyd very far out wow this is so cool and they're just hand drawings they're just like little sketches at first and then you know of course they're going to recreate these with photography and special effects so we we finally pick one it's got this guy going down into a dark room with a lantern, with his own image of him going down into this basement. And it looks very ominous and interesting. And okay, we like this one. This one's kind of cool. It was hard to pick, honestly, because none of them felt like the record felt. So it was kind of random in how we chose it. So he started to do it and he did it. And the record, he comes back to us. Funny, I'll just be very honest with you about it. We didn't love it we actually felt like it was pretty damn ugly and it did not look like the drawing to us. We felt like it looked like there was an old man on the cover and there, there was never a girl in a bikini in this sketch. And it was like going into a basement and that was a whole different scene. And we found it slightly cheekier and cornier and uglier. And now we have the storm Ferguson cover that we all actually were kind of repulsed by <laughs> immediately and um what are you gonna do pick another one from storm there's not another budget like we're gonna reject a storm thurgison cover we're not we're not gonna do that we set out to do something we worked with a great artist one of our favorite of all time we picked up a relationship in the meantime with the man and we're literally probably one of his last covers and he was warm and lovely and all about the artist's so that's it. We're going to keep it. It's just what it is. And it's not something that I, I feel angry about or bad about or think it's it's horrible. But it's funny. Our first reaction, that's what it, what it was. Like, not like, woo, we have a Storm Thurgerson. It's brilliant. We have we got Dark Side of the Moon Part 2. <laughs> this is the greatest thing ever. This is our Houses of the Holy cover. It didn't feel like that. But uh, now when I see it, I do think that there is an iconic element to it. It's, it's very bold, and a lot of people love it. And I think it just, to, to people, what that cover looks like is pressure and time. Yeah. And the tours that surrounded that record and the songs on that record, they were great. It was a, it's a great time, and it's a great record, if I, know, if I do say so myself. 
And um, I think people just like that, that were into the band. That's what they feel like. Oh, yeah, I love that cover. Feels like pressure in time. forward about a year from uh, the album Head Down, there's a particular song that I love, Keep On Swinging. It's just one more of those great rock riffs. How do you keep the creativity to keep on producing innovative and there's hooks in there as well? That's how we listen to music. It's how I listen to music. Not like I'm always looking for the hook, but I think there's a certain quality control inside my band with my producer, with the guys I work with. There's a level of musicianship. I'm critical as a producer and as a writer. I'm particularly something in rock and roll where people forget the craft a little bit. And as you become a songwriter, as as you're a songwriter and you go on and on writing and and learning and crafting, you start reviewing all your favorite songs and going, "Uh uh-huh, ah, God, that's beautiful. Gosh, that is so good. There's ne- I never feel like there's a flat spot or a lull in this song. Like I just feel good the whole time and it's great. And it doesn't necessarily need to be sugary or anything, but you just learn how to craft a song. And I'm fortunate that I work with people that understand that point and get it. Whether it's a drum beat or a verse melody or our pre-choruses or the bridge. So I play my role in all of that. And because we have this high level of songwriting and craft inside the group, this is what we try to turn out. Not to say that everything we create is exactly like that, 
but there is a, a string of craft throughout all of our songs and all of our records. That's what we like. That's how we think rock and roll should do. You're one of the handful of groups who've been releasing music, new contemporary music of the last 20 years, where the life hasn't been quantized and computerized. Things that the people's brains who are listening, interest in the music, keep that interest alive. That's what rock and roll is, isn't it? It is, isn't it? It, it, it? Rock and roll is... Well, it should be. It breathes. Rock and roll is a real... It has been from the inception of whatever you even want to like call rock and roll. Like even before we have what is rock and roll, if you want to say go back to like Little Richard and Chuck Berry and, you know, you want to go back to the beginning of soul music kind of like turning on its head and getting a little raucous. It's been kind of like the keystone to rock and roll is its humanness, its ability to breathe and shake and rattle and roll. You know what I mean? It's That's really what it's been the whole time. Other types of music aren't that. Other types of music have a more quantized nature to them, and it is part of its charm. Even classical music, the meter and the dynamic and the power of it, it's not loose. It's tight, and it's and it, it can loosen up emotionally, of course, and in, in, the, in the way it unfolds. But it's, it's, it's got a different movement to it that's tighter and it's more strained. Um, rock and roll is there's such a looseness and life and breath in it. And I think that was also part of what really turned me off when I started the band that, that was happening in music. It was gone. Everything had been quantized. Everything had been drum replaced. You can hear that they auto-tuned things. And it was the early days of auto-tune. It sounded like shit. Yeah. You can hear that they like popped in sections. You can hear that they recorded a drum track, then added the bass track, then added the guitars, and then added like five more guitars, and then maybe one more just in case we needed a heavier guitar sound, and then tripled the vocals. And it's like, how much are you underestimating the listener? This sounds like shit. This is horrifying, man. It's just dreadful. There's no life left in it. I feel like a, I'm under like a, a weighted blanket listening to this. It doesn't feel good at all. It's the opposite of rock and roll. So I just think that's to me and to us and to my producer, that's what is good about rock and roll. It's the faces on uh, the old gray whistle test. It's like, you know, a band, a l dirty, loose band breathing, playing. It's John Bonham falling out of time and dropping the beat by like five beats in a song and then picking it back up. It's Charlie Watts speeding uh, a honky tonk woman up constantly until the end of the song, until it sounds like it's running away with itself. That's what rock and roll is.
Open My Eyes is a another great example of a fantastic whole band performance where each instrument that the whole band is playing sparkles and pops out. In terms of crafting something like that in the studio, as you're saying, is it just a case of recording things as a band performance? What's the actual recording process for a song like that? We find all the elements that are working. In general, it will be, I find that the, that kind of a song will be anchored by the riff. Yeah. That big, dumb riff. And then also that drum beat too, mm. that's very reminiscent of what we all know. You know, it has that feel and it, it, it didn't start like that, but it's just kind of fun that we could do that. You know what I mean? It, we had a Helios desk. Right. We had the console that like Zeppelin was using. We had the same mics. We had the same room. And even for fun, we can just do it just to go, that's that. We know that's there. We can do that. Oh, that's cool. Well, let's do something a little bit different. We know we have that. But let's get that drum sound really quick in here and hear it. Yep. God, that is it. That's beautiful. A little bit of delay. That's pretty close. It's not exact, but we're doing something in that world. Let's just do that. Just shameless tip of the hat. And I know a lot of people will go, they're just ripping them off. People will say this about artists that sound like other artists. Listen, we do this shit all the time because it's fun. Because you tip your hat. You go, so great. This is one of my heroes. We're just going to like put this in our back pocket and throw it at you. So, you know, we love love it so much. And then we're going to spin you into a whole other direction. Nobody could ever accuse that song, really, of sounding like that song. Open My Eyes is not Levy. It is that those are not the same song. We took an element of their song, the most important element of their song, arguably. <laughs> it's fun. When you love something, you, you emulate it and you do it for fun. And th- this, this song started out probably anchored with the riff, which had nothing to do with, with Le- Zeppelin or the Levy at all. And this big beat, which had something to do with it and we thought would be fun to mesh it up. We sat in the room and I think Dave had a hand in writing those verses for our producer. Those are very much his kind of a voicing that he would contribute. What do you think about something like this? Ooh, I like that. Let's do that. And I'll add to it. And, I'm, you know, I wrote the pre-chorus. And that song came together very, very quick like that, like many of them do. And Jay will step out and start writing in the hallway. As we, like, by the time you come back, the stuff we just beat around here, we're going to have it tracked. And then we'll generally put the arrangement together inside of uh, 30 minutes or whatever, an hour, just figure it out, like how we want the song to unfold and then track it as a band. Here we go. Let's get a whole take top to bottom. Let's get a whole take where we're all playing um, at least one part, two parts. So we can follow the track, a bed track. And we have that drum take all the way through. We might have a bass track all the way through. And that's usually what we'll do. We'll build from there. Often I'll cut solos off the floor in those takes too, just because it's the first it's the first takes. It's like the energy. So I'll like, I know we know there's going to be a solo here. So who cares about the rhythm? We know what that's going to be. I'll just take the solo now. So we know a lot of those solos end up saying like that might've been an off the floor solo too bad was a, a, a bed track. That solo from too bad was off the floor. And I kind of remember doing the take and coming back and going, that take was great. All the, everything we did was great on that take. That's a keeper. Everything that I did Everything everyone did, except the solo. I need to redo the solo. I was just kind of like going through it. And Dave Cobb looked over at me like, "Uh, you're out of your mind. That solo was, that is the solo, dude. Holy shit, that was money. And I'm like, really? Yeah, let's play it back. Hear it back. Ah, all right, yeah, that was in there. I hear all the crafty in there. I was able to translate it. You just, you don't even know. It's so off the cuff sometimes. You're just hanging on for dear life. You know what I mean?
what was it like touring with Black Sabbath around that period? That was us between, I guess, was Hollow Bones and, and Great Western Valkyrie. Sure. Something that's beyond your wildest imagination, I guess. Like you imagine playing shows with your heroes. And even as we start coming up and doing well, our four, first tour when we signed to Eric was with Judas Priest. Like we just started playing with like our heroes. Like, oh, wow. We're like playing with these massive artists, even though it's a weird fit. It's incredible. It's fun. Like the way that whole thing happened, the way they saw us play at an award show and just approached us, Sharon and Ozzy going, we're doing a tour. There was no talk of a Sabbath tour yet. Uh, and Sharon coming over and Ozzy going, Ozzy saying, you guys are the best band, best new band I've ever seen. Wow. This is the greatest thing I've seen out of his mouth. And Sharon going, oh, we have this tour. You got to open the whole tour. You're going to do this whole thing with us. We'd love to have you out. My manager's here like, yes. <laughs> and we're going, what tour? Like an Aussie tour? No, Black Sabbath tour. You'll see. We'll send you everything. You guys are coming. Wow. Is that real? Like, that's that's not real. And then the offer did come in. And then we did 13 months with them. And nobody else came out, just us. Um, it was beyond your wildest dreams, man. Like, wow, I'm just out here with some of my biggest heroes. Black Sabbath, I certainly cut my teeth on records like Paranoid and the first record and Masters. These were like records that were right in my, they were in my world, in my crawl, you know, like, wow, that's the sound. And as a teenager listening to bands like, like Soundgarden was one of my favorite, favorite bands still is today. You just hear the Sabbath and you just hear it all connecting and it was just amazing, man. They were affable, lovely people. The Sabbath that we toured with, their family men, their grandfathers, I mean, you know, and yet still just uh, attacking their craft with all the passion, like probably to a degree more passion than they did when they were younger because they're not on cocaine. They're not on drugs. They're not diluted and watered down. They're so focused and wonderful and collected and balanced and like proud of what they have. And they've stayed really dear friends, all of them. And they're just, it's warm. Their families come out. It's just the dedication freaked me out. And I'm forever changed getting to sit on multiple shows behind Tony Iommi and just watch Tony dig into these sets with all the fervor and all the dedication that you can muster. But I watched it, man, five feet away right behind him and just went, I can't believe it. He is so pulled in to like what's happening. And so on that shit and so laying it in the cut so nicely, it really affected me. And it will, as a guitar player and a, a lifetime musician now, it's just something that's going to stay with me forever, man. It reminded me that's how you do it. There's a way that you can stay connected. And if I don't get uh, rich and famous, I have that. I have that with my boys on stage. I have that with myself and my instrument and my songs. And that's cool. And that's how I want to be. When I grow up, I want to be just like this guy. That's cool. He's cool. I brought my kids out on some of the legs of that tour. and They were warm to my children. Sharon would watch my kids during the show so I could go off and do interviews and stuff. Ozzy would come and sneak up behind my kids while they played video games in full makeup and it's something I'll never forget. We probably shouldn't have been out there for 13 months uh, while we're putting records out, supporting an artist that's going to just overshadow us. And, um, you know, 90% of the people that are coming to that show don't know what Arrival Sons is. We're going to have to win an audience over every night. But uh, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't change it. And it was uh, an experience that'll it'll never be uh, replicated, you know? What about the uh, the Grammys tribute in front of them doing their own songs? It was weird, but you know what? We knew what we had, and we knew we were going to smash it. We were on tour, so we had to kind of work that, those out on the road. And we were rehearsing. Just I think we had a, like maybe three rehearsals or something, three shows before, leading up to it. So we just took our sound check and created this little medley. I don't know if you saw the whole medley, but it was a three-song medley that we did. Which order did we do it? God, what was the middle track? I think that's the one they cut out. Um, changes, War Pigs, and Paranoid. We And we run them all together. We ran, And we kind of did, do you know the Charles Bradley version of Changes? Right. We kind of did that, like with the tremolo, which suits Jay very much, like soul singer, blue-eyed soul kind of like vibe. 
So we did uh, this three song medley and we made something that we thought this is cool. We taped it at three rehearsals and could hear it back and went, this is dope. This honors them. Good. We spent 13 months with them. We know what they sound like. We can like get a good sound and put our own swing on it. And, uh, it was fun to honor our friends and and be there for them and a great honor. I was sad Ozzy and Sharon didn't come to that, but the rest of the fellows did. And I got to hand them their Lifetime Achievement Award. And it just felt appropriate and lucky from my standpoint, super lucky. <laughs> then they were wonderful again. Ladies and gentlemen, rival sons. The very last song I want you to ask you about is Do Your Worst from Feral Roots. That was a period where at least some of the material you were writing with Jay in the Tennessee woods. A different approach where you went away from the technology of life and got back to basics. Yeah, like I said uh, earlier, we had some time to work on Feral Roots. We were just um, coming out of that long tour and kind of like looking at a lot of our business 
we actually had a lot of problems releasing hollow bones previously. So we thought we got to, you know, we didn't have distribution in the U S and we ended up switching hands with, with our management and like all of this stuff going on. We just need to take a minute. And this next thing, although hollow bones was a tremendous move forward from great Western Valkyrie for us in the sound of the band. Wow. It became much more modern on hollow bones. We felt like we needed to take a, a equal or bigger step forward on feral roots. It just felt like that. Like we are, we were reaching for something and we need to fully realize it on this next record, I think. So we gave ourselves that time and went out there and me and Jay just, that's where it started. And, and this was a first where me and him just said, we, the two of us need to really get our heads together because very often we will disagree about songs and, and directions. What I tell people is that stuff we disagree on, you're glad. You're glad we disagree. That's the thing that people want. It's like we have two very big, strong perspectives that are different and it creates something kinetic and interesting. You get two very different things coming together and it makes some one interesting thing. But on Feral Roots, we really wanted to try something different and put our heads together, our hearts together, and really aim at something together for the first time. And I had a bunch of ideas, and he had a bunch of ideas, and we went out to this cabin, had a dilapidated dilapidated boathouse and this private property and this lake, and it was really far out. We had like a razor, this little off-road dune buggy thing, and motorcycles, and like literally hanging at this creek and riding these off-road vehicles around in the trees and just like getting together at night and doing songs, singing songs acoustically. We had uh, basses and guitars plugged in inside the cabin. We made fires, cooked for each other, and just talked concept and lit riffs and musical ideas and shot all sorts of stuff at each other. And it made for a great chemistry and it made for a focused uh, point of view and a real focused album did a bunch of weird stuff on Feral Roots too. We changed our studio like in the last moment. We recorded the whole record at RCA. And then Dave Cobb said, I think we should change studios. I have an opportunity for us to work at Muscle Shoals, the Muscle Shoals, the small room. Let's go do it. Yes, let's go do it. So we had to move. There wasn't even a desk there. There wasn't even a, a mix console there. So he had to take his own console. We got a, we got our own new console moved in there. All of our mics and everything got to a new new place to stay and finished up and did four days or something at Muscle Shoals. But it was integral, man. We captured Feral Roots there. We captured Stood By. We captured All Directions. Uh, all this like very integral, important material happened there in that last fourth quarter. Created a new energy, a new excitement. I'm proud of that record. I, I listen to it now and it feels focused and adventurous all at once for us. Such a busy year for Rival Sons. So you've imminently, you've got Dark Fighter, then you've got Lightbringer. And across this whole year and including um, October, November, you're coming to the UK and Europe. I can't wait to bring the show over. As focused as I felt uh, Feral Roots was when we made, made it and how much I enjoy that record now. Uh, I feel like this is a very natural step forward for the band. I feel like this is a much, if, if that's possible, mm. even much more focused, much more unified and um, focused and experimental and crafted record that we're delivering. And we've just started playing it live in a room. And it's great to bring these songs to people on stage is where these songs really start to live because the symbiosis on stage between the band, bringing these songs to life. We don't iron these songs out too much when we record them. It becomes something new when we record or when we start to play them live. Yeah. And then more importantly is the symbiosis between the audience and the band. Like we have our thing we're doing, but then when we start playing these, we find all of these interesting little corners, how the songs work on people, how people start to enjoy them. You start to learn like, oh, that bridge and that song really works on these on the audience. They're affected by it. Or that lit lyric, everyone sings that every night. You just don't know until you start doing it. So like that, all of our records take on this 
whole new life every time we start to play them. And this record, we are just so excited to like do that. So you're going to get that. We're going to play these records. We're going to play Dark Fighter. We're going to play the whole thing for you. Sit tight. You're going to get a bunch of old songs too. We're not going to just play just this. You're going to get everything, but you're going to get that record in a chunk. I think we're going to play that whole thing top to bottom. And when Lightbringer comes, you better believe it. We're probably going to do that too. (laughs) Brilliant. Thanks so much, Scott. It's been a real pleasure. Great to talk with you. Cheers, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. for listening to the strange brew podcast if you do like the show please consider a small donation to help keep the show archive online it's 10 years since i started the podcast and hosting fees are increasing over time all your support keeps the show running and helps me get amazing guests to support me just go to the strangebrew.co.uk where you'll see a donate button on the home page thank you very much Plus, any reviews on your podcast services help to spread the word too. Thank you.